You have in front of you the full uh, Romans 14 text for today that continues to lift up themes of uh, judgment and forgiveness. But I only want to read the last three verses, verses 10 through 12. Paul writes, Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will be held accountable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Earlier this week, while reading a blog post on the Matthew Gospel passage, I was reminded of several ways that people of faith who are writers and whose opinions I value and respect have sought to understand forgiveness. Anne Lamott, in her memoirs, Traveling Mercies, likens withholding forgiveness to drinking rat poison and expecting the rat to die. Nora Gallagher says, forgiveness is a way to unburden oneself from the constant pressure of rewriting the past. And Henri Nouwen says, forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. The hard truth is that all people love poorly and so we need to forgive and be forgiven every day, every hour increasingly. Forgiveness is the great work of love among the fellowship of the weak that is the human family. Today's gospel reading picked up immediately where we left off last Sunday. But let me give you just briefly the Cliff Notes version of the whole of Matthew's 18th chapter so that we can reorient ourselves as to where these texts are coming from. In chapter 18, Matthew brings together in one singular unit material that is relevant for life together as the community of faith, the church. It begins with disciples coming to Jesus and asking him, who is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven? To which Jesus calls a child before them and says, those who humble themselves like this little child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Hyperbole and exaggeration are then used to bring home the point of what a tragedy it is to fall into sin, followed by the beloved parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd is happier about going out and finding the one lost sheep than he is over the 99 sheep who didn't wander off. Matthew then includes Jesus' teaching of what the church is to do when one member sins against another, which was the text that Pastor Ken preached on last Sunday. In today's text, Peter, who having heard this process of dealing with members who sin against one another, asks, well, how many times... Really, how many times do I need to forgive another member who sins against me? Now, while Peter is the one who is recorded as having asked the question, I think it's fair to say that Peter was not the only one wondering about this question, and I believe that he certainly was not the last disciple in all of the ages to ask and wonder a similar question. And I think part of that is because we are unable to process and then to embrace the enormity of God's love and God's mercy. But really, friends, is the one who leaves 99 good sheep to search out one who's wandered off really going to set limits for how many times we are to forgive someone who sins against us? Well, if we've been tracking what Matthew has been trying to tell us, we know the answer is no. Jesus' response to the question of how many times we are to forgive another, not just seven times, but as many as 77 times, 
isn't a matter of making the number of times forgiveness must be extended greater. Rather, Jesus is pushing outside of what is easily quantifiable. Forgiveness is the work of the fellowship of the church. Forgiveness is always the work that the community and its members is called to. And there is no quota that when reached allows us to stop doing the work. At this point, Matthew shares one of Jesus's parables which I think is a difficult parable. And so I want to suggest that we use this particular parable as a mirror. Soren Kierkegaard, who is a Danish philosopher and theologian of the 19th century, believed that the fundamental purpose of God's word, that is to say the fundamental purpose of scripture, is to give us true self-knowledge. Kierkegaard likens scripture to a mirror, which when we look at ourselves in it, we see things that God wants us to see about ourself. So I suggest building on Kierkegaard's understanding that we consider that perhaps the primary purpose of today's parable is to reveal to us something about our own character and our own nature. Now remember, within the parable, there is a king who discovers that a servant owes him 10,000 bags of gold. This is a ridiculously exorbitant amount of money. The servant must have been in charge of the books of the wealthiest part of the kingdom, and he must have been about the work of embezzlement for an extended period of time in order to accrue such wealth and such debt. The king, knowing that this servant is never going to recover this enormous amount of money, decides to seek revenge by selling the slave and his family and everything that he owns, allowing for at least a portion of the amount owed to be recouped. The servant, though, knowing the horrors of and the abuses that would come to him and to his family, begs begs and pleads for the king to be patient in order that he might pay him back. Now, this is absurd. In no way, shape, or form, in no entity whatsoever is that ever going to be possible. The amount of money owed is so astronomical. The man cannot, in the course of his lifetime or five lifetimes, repay this debt. Yet the king had compassion for the man, he not only releases the servant, but he also forgives him the debt. The debt of 10,000 bags of gold is erased. What a gift. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? The servant is given freedom, freedom to live his life with his family, freedom from the enormous crippling burden of debt. The servant is free from any form of retaliation or revenge. How would you respond to being given such a remarkable gift? You'd be so grateful, wouldn't you? You would spend the rest of your life living in gratitude because you would receive such a good gift. That certainly would be an appropriate response, yes? A life in which one extends the same mercy and compassion in their own living? That isn't what occurs. The servant whose debt of 10,000 bags of gold, which has been forgiven, encounters a fellow servant who owes him 100 coins. He takes that servant by the throat, demands payment, and when he is unable to pay him back, throws him into prison. The servant, having been given another way to live, a way not defined by retaliation or revenge, is unable to leave that way of life behind. Why? 
Why is the servant unable to embody the life of forgiveness that he's been given? I wonder if the servant is unable to embody the life of forgiveness because he's not able to accept it for himself. A gift that is offered, in order for it to be a gift, must be a gift received. Perhaps the servant was unable to receive the generosity of forgiveness extended to him. Part of the work of forgiveness within the community is to hear and to receive the forgiveness God gives us. Friends, this is hard work. For most of us, this is hard and difficult work. We believe that our debt is too big to be forgiven. We don't believe at our core that we are worthy or deserving of forgiveness. Looking into the mirror of this parable, perhaps we are unable to embody a life of forgiveness because we are unable to accept the gift ourselves. And so, we continue to live in ways that are defined by retaliation and retribution. Now, to reiterate something that I heard Pastor Ken lift up last week, we are to make no mistake, to embody a life of forgiveness is not to live a life in which you are someone's doormat or their punching bag. It does not mean accepting oppression or violence or abuse as a way of life. Going back to the process that was outlined earlier in the chapter that we heard last week, severing the relationship and isolating an individual who inflicts harm is what should occur when an individual does not alter their harmful behavior. As you look into the mirror of this parable, what do you see? What is God desiring for you to see about yourself? I know looking in a mirror makes us vulnerable, but should you choose to look in this mirror, the one who is desiring to show you something about yourself is the very one who searched for the one lost sheep. The one who provides the mirror for you to look into is one who knows you by name, who loves you and forgives you. To not accept the gift of forgiveness God gives, to not do the work of forgiveness within the community, and to do that work considering the tremendous gift of forgiveness God has given us, is a grave tragedy. I think that this may be the point of the end of the parable. When the king hears from other servants that the forgiven servant has continued to live in a world of revenge and retaliation, rather than living into the compassion and the mercy that he's been given, the king responds in kind, handing him over to be tortured until he could pay his debt which as we've already established, is not possible. The text ends, So my heavenly Father will do to each and every one of you, should you not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. To not do the work of forgiveness is a grave tragedy. As I look into the mirror of this parable, I see that forgiveness is no small matter. I see there is nothing insignificant or easy about the work of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a matter of life and freedom over torture and death. We pray every Sunday, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors which is to say, forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Do we really mean it? Do we want God to forgive our debts based on the ways in which we forgive those debtors around us? 
we likely have some work to do. Friends, if we can accept the gift of God's compassion, mercy, and forgiveness to us, then we are free to live in ways that embody the same. To live that out, we must resist the pull of a transactional nature of the world, which is so often based on values and principles that are rooted in retaliation and revenge. Staying in that place prohibits us from living into being the people that God created us to be, people created for love and wholeness. We are invited to look into the mirror to see the ways we fall short, not so that we can be humiliated or punished, but rather so we can see the truth about ourselves and in humility and in faithfulness change our ways. And that hearing and receiving God's forgiveness, we can live as forgiven, loved, and freed people of God. So knowing this, let us confess our sin before God and one another using our unison prayer for reconciliation. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we admit that we are not always loving and kind. We know we can be selfish and mean to other people, even to people we love. Forgive us for the words we say and the things we do that hurt other people. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. God, you love and forgive not only us, but all people. Teach us to be like you. Show us how to love and forgive those who are not kind or loving to us. Give us your power to forgive them when they are as selfish and mean as we sometimes are. Help us forgive them when they do things and say words that hurt us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Make us deeply aware that we are forgiven and help us forgive those who sin against us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.